Yeah. Soon as class starts, everyone. Y'all ready to get started? So Nathan has a game at one o'clock. We're all getting out at one. So don't thank Nathan. Pat him on the back on the way out. Don't hit Logan so hard that that will not feel good. Um, that sucks, dude. <laughs> Sometimes it is what it is. Uh, they're still paying you, though, aren't they? Oh yeah. That's all that matters. <laughs> all right. Um, I need to back up just a little bit. Just because um, it's been like almost a month since the last time we took any kind of notes. Um, so, I think when we left off a long time ago, and it had to be like Snowden. Um, well, we talked about the wind erosion, and then we have like the, the three same kind of mechanisms. The mechanics of it is that the wind blows, it detaches the soil, picks it up and moves it somewhere, and then it settles where it's deposited. Same mechanics as water erosion. Um, however, there are different, uh, like I guess within those mechanics, uh, we talked about saltation, this being the little bouncing. Uh, we have soil creep where you kind of watch like soil kind of move across a surface or like uh, I guess maybe like uh, if you were like at a beach. This is where I see, when I think about soil creep, I think about like at a beach where the soil just kind of moves and eventually forms a dune. Um, and then the soil that's left in the air. Y'all remember this illustration? Um, we lose about 300 tons of soil per acre per year. Causes us some problems with our production because it can um, kind of abrade the skin. Think about sandpaper coming across your tomato crop or um, some other uh, soft, fleshy tissue kind of fruit or vegetable. Um, if it, if it gets deposited somewhere else, like it can be expensive to remove that. Like we have this problem on the beach. Like I'm from the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Like every once in a while, they have to come and pick that sand up out of the road, put it back in the beach, just so that it can go back in the road. So that's, that's an incurring cost that they have to do with this thing, uh, that they really don't have much of a uh, solution for. The sand can be fine. And, It'll make its way in places you didn't want to make it into. Um, we talked about velocity, turbulence, some roughness, some of the factors that are going to influence that soil erosion. Someone mentioned that soil moisture weighs the soil down. So that's why it's important to kind of keep our soil moisture so that we can minimize our wind erosion. Um, tree breaks and wind breaks. So let's say that we had. Um, trees that were 10 feet in height as a windbreak, how much area is protected from that wind erosion? 100 feet, right? So 10 times the height of our tree. If we had just grass up there, how much uh, a five foot grass span? About how much would we have protection? Yeah. Five times the height. Okay. So 25 to 35 times the height, right? Just try that home. The taller your tree, the bigger area that you have to protection from that wind. All right, so um, I think this is going to be kind of our transition from the things that we do in the soil. Um, this is our last kind of. Uh, we've been over terraces and we know about contour farming and we've had some uh, discussions and some presentations about some different practices that we can do to minimize some of this um, soil runoff and and i was only left with the soil portion of this class it's called soil and water conservation but there was no water conservation left for me so we'll be talking about that water conservation to complete this out but the, the transition is going to be the, the, the most important thing that you can do, the biggest tool in your toolbox to minimize soil erosion is going to be cover crops, right? Um, cover crops have a ton of benefits. I mean, this, like I've only got like 10, or maybe 10 up there. Um, this is not a cover crop class. We could probably spend a whole class, at least a half of a semester, just going over cover crops and the things that we can do with them. 
Uh, we'd have Kenny Pierce come in. He would talk about cover crops, and he would do that for the second half of the class. So um, this is a whole discipline in its own uh, cover crops. One of the biggest things about cover crops is going to be that some of those uh, have this atmospheric nitrogen fixation. And so, again, um, as I was talking to my soil chemistry class, uh, going along with this carbon sequestration that plants are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, through, because that's how they conduct photosynthesis, and then storing that in the roots. And so if you have your whole field pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, putting some oxygen back, and sequestering that carbon. So this is gonna be one of the biggest tools uh, that you will probably be using as land manager, and one of the most effective. Um, it's got some uh, improvement for the soil till. Uh, we're, remember, we're trying to improve our infiltration because if water infiltrates, it doesn't run off, right? So we can get water in the soil, not in the ditch. Uh, and then there are some of those that we can use that are going to have some of this allelopathy or um, they can break up disease and pest cycles. Um, and some of them are pretty. Some are actually very colorful. Buckwheat and hairy vetch has these purple flowers. Um, mustards and brassicas are yellow and like this. So there's these all these positive things that you can do with these cover crops. We typically kind of break those into three classes. One being our grasses, so ryegrass, annual ryegrass. We have our legumes, which are going to be our nitrogen fixers, and then um, our brassicas. And so um, the brassicas have made this kind of, uh, they've come on the scene because they have the potential for the soil compaction to break that up um, and that they have these uh, this they can suppress these pests and pathogens and other winter weeds so yep uh, like a mustard okay um, so like mustard greens um, turnips broccoli broccoli kale. kale so like our cool season vegetables um, I don't know that we would be planting broccoli in our fields but you can plant mustards and if you cut them early enough, th th then they won't. Turnips. Turnips, so all of those things. So like when we talk about those brassicas, they're a species of plants. My grandparents grow a lot of those things in their garden. Not that we would be planting our whole field in turnips because that, that could be a cash crop too, right? Some people, I didn't fall off a turnip truck. So some people do grow those vegetables for their subsistence, but there are some of them that we can use that are that we may not grow for a cash crop. Typically, you won't grow your cover crops for a cash crop. They provide some extra benefit because they're covering the soil. Um, but that's kind of the biggest thing with these brassicas. Um, so that's what separates the three of those. Is that our grasses are going to have like this extensive root system uh, that is going to scavenge nutrients. Um, our legumes are primarily for fixing nitrogen, and then our brassicas um, are pretty, and that they will reduce compaction and have some uh, like they provide like a biofuel. Um, so they they may have a role in some other system. I'm not sure how that could be, but I guess. Um, as I was thinking over spring break, uh, the, the thing students want to know the most is where do I apply this and how? And um, what's the answer? And we're all looking for the answer, but there is no yes or no. Like there is no plant this plant. I used to hate going into my professor's office and asking him to knock on the door, ask a question and leave knowing less than when I showed up there, right? There's nothing worse than going or emailing someone and not getting an answer or asking a question and then be like, oh, well, all depends on pH and, uh, and all this other stuff. It's like, great. So as, for, as instructors, educators here, it is our goal to give you the tools and then you will eventually maybe apply those at some point in time. Um, 
can't tell you to plant brassicas in your field and tell Annalisa to plant brassicas too. It just may not work for the same thing. So to introduce everyone to the possibilities and then you get to pick and make your own. That's something I didn't know as a student. I didn't realize that technically my answer is the answer. As long as it's not wrong, then it's right. Like applying 240 pounds of phosphorus per acre. That's wrong. <laughs> uh, I was from class earlier. As I mentioned, nutrient scavengers, but something to um, kind of pay attention for with uh, these, these grasses is that they have a greater carbon to nitrogen ratio. And when I say greater, well, we're talking maybe 20 to 30 to 1. So a carbon of, let's say, 25 and nitrogen of 1. So uh, because they had that greater carbon to nitrogen ratio, uh, there might be some immobilization. But you're going to have the nutrients that they scavenged in there. It just might take longer for them to release them back to the soil. Um, and then also that there's this uh, shoot to root ratio. And so um, here we see that we have our roots that are growing down. We have this extensive root system. And then we have shoot growth on the top. And we know that if we have more shoot growth, we would have more root growth but our legumes are kind of more flat and kind of prostrate and growing out rather than they are growing up. So they would have a greater root to shoot ratio. Hopefully I'll be, hopefully I'll be able to explain that a little bit better, but then we're gonna have more top growth with our grasses. So you might see rye grass in a field get this high. Maybe hip high. Anyone walk through your pastures at home and you're like wading through it, right? So we have a greater shoot to root ratio, whereas we would have a different uh, for our legumes. Also, that we have a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio, and so our carbon to nitrogen ratio is going to be important for releasing those nutrients sooner, like this. The material will break down easier. The microbes don't need a lot of energy in order to decompose this. Um, think about the difference between a corn stalk and let's say um, a four leaf clover. Big difference in the two, like one is like soft and velvety and kind of, it's easy to tear apart. It takes a long time to tear apart a, a corn stalk. Like it takes a bit, right? It's just the, the way that the plant is made up, the way it grows. So having an understanding of what your plant material is can give you an understanding of how well that's going to decompose. Uh, just a couple of pictures of some uh, popular legumes that um, are kind of popular in the market today. We're seeing clovers making kind of a uh, uh, surgeons in the market, crimson clover, uh, hairy vetch is kind of a standby. This is our, like our, our mainstay. Uh, we've got this trellisy kind of growth pattern. It might grow up to about here. It's easy to walk through um, and it covers the ground but still allows some rainfall to get through. So um, just to kind of see these, you might see these around the roadside before they cut. I don't know how y'all cut in Tennessee. I don't know how you cut in Tennessee, um, but typically in Mississippi, they cut when they see it start seeing crimson clover come out. That's their that's their cue to uh, mow the field. So they mow or mow the right away, it's like on the sides of the road. And so they'll do that like twice a year. Uh, and then finally, our brassicas. This is a tillage radish, um, and so these are. Uh, especially this tillage radish is kind of making its way onto the scene because it kind of furrows into the soil it's like a carrot. Basically, it grows below the soil. And so uh, when that radish decomposes, there's a hole left there. And if there's a hole left, then water can fill that hole up. If you have a whole bunch of those little holes all over your field, you at least increase the potential for more 
more water may stay on your field rather than leaving out. You got all these little holes. So it's going to fill up a little bit more, and that increases some infiltration. Also, the, these um, radishes are growing down, and like uh, as they grow, they are expanding. And when they expand, they, they, they push that soil and break it a little bit, and it cracks some. And, you have another radish on the other side pushing. So now you have two or three of these radishes in this close vicinity and they're all pushing and pressuring against the soil. And that just kind of breaks it up just a little bit. They have some little uh, root hairs that move out and kind of make a little channel or a micropore and they're breaking it a little bit and it cracks and it fractures and more water can get in there. So you get this tillage effect from growing this. Um, it has that allelopathy, it's got this biofume again, um, primarily they're using this for nematodes that chew on the roots of our vegetables that are high dollar crops. Um, they have some colors, mustards are really yellow, and you can see them in the field, then there's nothing better than driving down the, field, down the road and seeing just that yellow kind of marigold color just all the way like, ah, oh, thank you so much. This is also very nice for me to see as well, um, that we have this mixture, we have this biodiversity, uh, that if you plant them in the right, you can, get, you can get into mixes of which one you want to do and what the ratios are. Um, that stuff's kind of boring. You're going to buy a pack, it's going to have a mixture, and you're going to put it out there because we're just trying to keep our, our soil covered. So not necessarily that we're too big on what the ratio is. There's some scientist somewhere else who's determined that. They've done the research on it and they tell the seed company, put 25, 50, and 25 in there and you buy. But to have an understanding, I guess the thing that I personally didn't like about the mixes is that we have this grass in there, this, this, this rye grass, that kind of offsets our carbon to nitrogen ratio. And so some of the data that I look at and I go, yeah, but you're, you're, you're not gaining the yield or the nitrogen uh, input in the spring because you have this grass in there. But they are increasing uh, that root surface area and scavenging more nutrients and eventually it will break down. So we put legumes in there to offset that carbon to nitrogen ratio, balance that out a little bit, um, and so now those materials start to decompose a little bit better. So if you're looking at mixes, um, right off the bat, it might not look like this is a great thing compared to just like a hairy veg or a crimson clover. Um, but don't worry, they're doing a lot of research on it. There are people out there that swear by these things. Uh, we're getting that increased biodiversity. We're getting a different root system and we're getting different de decomposition rates that are putting that organic matter back into the soil. So I take this kind of with a grain of salt, do a little bit of research, but for the most part, when you're at a company or a organization and you say, we're gonna do this mix, you'll typically pick about three options try and pick the best one for you, for your situation, and just go with it. I would encourage you not to overthink that. It drives me crazy when I overthink it. So don't drive yourself crazy. Trust the science, pick one or two that you like, and just go with it. Maybe go for color, maybe go for nitrogen, it all depends on what your goal is. Which is, on the next slide. So what is the goal that we're trying to do? I don't know. Each situation is going to be different, but that's the first step that you should address. What am I trying to achieve with planting this cover crop? Yeah, we know we're trying to keep our uh, soil from eroding and increase infiltration, but what are some of the other benefits that I'm trying to get out of this? Um, the timing. Uh, when do you plant it? It's going to vary by ecoregion or right, pretty much just the region. Like in Mississippi, 
we try and plant right after. Um, sometimes we can get away with it because we don't have very many um, cold days in a row. So we can plant our cover crops a little bit later, um, but uh, here in Tennessee, it's like September because it gets cold in December and we're gonna get that first snap. So there's a growth habit that goes with it and you need to be aware of what your weather patterns are so that you don't basically spend a whole bunch of money to put a crop out that dies before it does what it's supposed to do. Uh, there's going to be some equipment that you're going to need for that. Um, and then we should always be keeping records to find out what we did, when we did it, how we did it, why we did it, and what the effect of that was. Still have a problem with this number of 20 to 24 to 1, but someone that has many more books written than I do, uh, this is what his number was, and I'm going to trust him. Uh, one of the well-respected soil scientists of the of the industry, and I'm not going to argue with him. Uh, but it's about 24 to 1, and so nitrogen provides this energy source for these microbes to be able to, to uh, decompose this material and so some of our, somewhere between 20 to 1 and 29 to 1, and 30 to 1, I guess that would be right in the middle, but we would have this, uh, it's even. It's, it, 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 we don't have mineralization and we don't have immobilization. So, but at 20 to 1 and below, we would have a net mineralization. Below 20 to 1, you have a net mineralization. Above 30 to 1, you have a net immobilization. And the reason is, as I was explaining in my soil chemistry class earlier, we grow a corn crop that's 57 to 1, and we apply our nitrogen in the fall, I mean in the spring, when it's time to apply it, and the microbes need some of that nitrogen that we apply. And so you tell them, hey, you need to go and put 200 pounds of nitrogen out there. And they expect a yield result from that. And when it doesn't happen, they go, what? Hey, you told me. Because that's what people, they always want to go, you did this to me. Yeah, how dare you? I'm paying you good money to tell me what to do. I did what you told me to, it doesn't work. Because that carbon to nitrogen ratio is so high, those microbes immobilized some of the nitrogen in order to decompose this material. Down here, it's going to mineralize that because there's not as much carbon there. They don't need to break it down as much, right? Because our legumes and our clovers are very soft and succulent. They rip those really easy. It's easy for the microbes to digest it. They like that first. It's soft and it's got some moisture. It's really good. Corn, not so much. It's dry. It's woody. It's stemmy. Difficult to break down. So those cover crops are going to scavenge the soil over the winter. And when we terminate them in the spring, they're going to add them back to the soil at some decomposition rate based on a carbon to nitrogen ratio, or a carbon to phosphorus ratio, or carbon to sulfur. She just started falling asleep on me. <laughs> so I've been telling her this, I've been just carbon to carbon to carbon to carbon. Um, here's a look at those tillage radishes. I don't trust this picture, those are really clean. I don't know how you got, I don't know how you got those that clean. Because if you've been buried under soil for a whole growing season, um, Unless you use some bleach, I don't know. But anyhow, th this is the this is the concept of what those tillage radishes do. And so we have this long tap root that actually gets down and starts to break this pan up. And if we break the pan a little bit, we get some water infiltration, and that's going to improve infiltration and reduce runoff. The timing, um, 
there are cool season and warm season, and it just all depends. I have not had much uh, interaction with warm season because during that time we're planting our cash crop and we're trying to grow that. We have already terminated our cool season species and now we have something on our farm that is making us money. So, but there are options for warm season depending on whatever your cash crop is. Again, I don't know what your situation is going to look like in four years. Here are some options for you to pick from that will benefit your situation in four years. Kind of what that looks like. Um, how are you going to drill it? Are you going to broadcast it? Things to take into consideration, seeding rates. Are you going to flail mower it? Is it roller crimper, roller crimper? Are you going to spray it? In Mississippi, we just spray, we just spray Roundup. Deal with it later. Effective, efficient, might not be environmentally the best. So think about those things. Think about those things when you're planning out how you're going to do this. Um, and then uh, if you ever get to that point, you want to make sure that you uh, terminate your crop before it gets to seed. So right at about flower, because that is when the most nutrients have made it up out of the soil. It's not taking up many more nutrients. It's now starting to put those into reproduction. So that's when the most nutrients are in the plant to store all that up. You terminate it it decomposes and then, de and then adds that nutrient back to the soil. Alright, um, something that I was thinking about over uh, spring break is this concept of nutrient removal through our crop. I'm not sure that that has been, I don't know that it's been discussed or taught in any other classes. No? No? All right. So we're going to do just a basic example. It's not a very difficult thing to do, um, but it is important when you're starting to do like nutrient budgets, um, you can start to calculate how much you inputted, how much you took out, what's left in the soil, and that means that if it's not in the crop, and it's not in the soil, it's in the water. And if I know on my field that I'm doing the best that I got going on, the EPA comes and I've got documentation, guess what the EPA does? They leave me alone, which is the whole goal is to have the EPA not be on your farm asking you a bunch of questions that you don't have the answer to. So, Basically, the calculation is, it, it's, it's a pretty simple calculation. Biomass times nutrient percentage, and you can do this for any of your nutrients. You, you take a sample, or you carve, anybody do hay? Anyone? So. Every once in a while, you'll send it off for, for a nutrient analysis, right? Just to know what's in there. And so then you can start to know what the nutrient content of this hay bale is. And that's a whole other mathematical class, Dr. Benawal, horses, and animal feeds. Um, so we'll take our dry, dry matter biomass, about 4,000 pounds per cow feed. And we have about three and a half percent nitrogen. This is where you would get this from the uh, plant tissue analysis report. You'll take a sample, it'll send you back and say 3.29% nitrogen. But just to give a simple example, um, and that 50% of that is going to be plant available nitrogen. All right? And we do that math, comes up to about 70 pounds of nitrogen. This is the 70 pounds you don't have to buy at the co-op. Unless you've been growing continuous corn, this 70 pounds is now gone. And probably some of the fertilizer that you put out too because you've got continuous corn at 57 to one. That 
carbon ratio is high, nitrogen ratio is low, so any nitrogen inputs into that system, the microbes are going to take. So they have to break this carbon. So what is the dry matter? The dry matter? Dry matter. Yes, ma'am. So here is a table, and I've given you some opportunities to practice some of this math. Um, I guess we can do, let's do the first one. So we have this mark. Thousand two hundred thirty seven pounds of dry matter per acre. number for me? 66.3. 66.3. Is that what everyone else got? Got it, Andrew. Is that what? 66.3. Sense of need to do another one? Hannah? Okay. What was it? Uh, and one divided by a hundred, one point six one divided by a hundred is zero point zero one six one. So like, where does the zero point five come from? 
Um, it's the, that's how much plant available in. They just kind of said that half of the nitrogen that's in there is going to be like eventually be plant available. So like mineralized, ammonification, nitrogen. Did, did y'all stomach start to turn a little bit when I started going through? <laughs> so that is going through because it's 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 in an organic form once it starts to decompose, and so those microbes have to go through aminization, mineralization, nitrification, that whole process. And so they just basically said about half of what is there is going to undergo, because the, the microbes are still gonna need some of this to break down the, the carbon material that is from this 8237 pound. And so this is something this is something that you can do. We really wouldn't do this uh, plant available in because that's part of the conversion that goes back into the soil. So if we weren't to do this, we would have there would be 122.6 pounds of nitrogen in the plant material that we removed. And so if you apply 200 and you removed 122, and there's whatever is in the soil, the rest is somewhere else. That is how you are able to tell how efficient or effective your system is. And no one's taught y'all that yet, have they? It's okay. You know, I, I don't want you to leave not knowing. I don't want you to go, you came from Tennessee Tech and you had soil and water conservation and blah, 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 and you don't know this? That gives Tech a bad day. Also doesn't make you feel very well either because you're like, I paid all this money and they didn't tell me the one thing that I, so I might try to incorporate some of that in, but this kind of calculation is how you would determine the amount of nitrogen or the nutrient that is in one acre that was removed from the plant. it all down it kind of gives you just an idea of some of the things that you can some of the the more common uh, cover crops that you would probably use sorghum to ingress maybe not so much um, buckwheat is real good for attracting pollinators it's got this nice white flower grows really quick covers your soil very fast um, it's going to have some nitrogen to it and then just to kind of sum this up is that we got biomass, we're going to fix and add nitrogen, and then we're suppressing pests and adding them. Um, so this is probably going to be your most effective tool to minimizing soil erosion. Like as I was thinking about it, we really don't have 12 to 20 percent slopes in Tennessee, or do we? Some places, Isaac's like, yeah, my house. <laughs> um, but we're not farming on those. So the terraces and the, and the, <laughs> the bench terraces and um, things like that may be okay. Like the grass waterways might be something that you would use, uh, but this cover crop thing is gonna be the one. That's gonna be the easiest, simplest, most effective, and the bang for your buck. So we're gonna have an exercise well, I guess in assignment two, we're going to get to see how much you actually did make by planting these cover crops are safe versus soil erosion with bare soil uh, that's going to go along with the universal soil loss equation. Like, I've got to try and find a way to make it applicable for y'all. Um, I wasn't left with much. <laughs> so. That's kind of where I'm at with that. I, like, I want to be able to make sure that you took something from this class other than notes. All right? Nathan's got a baseball game to get to. Y'all have a good day. <laughs>
We could be here all, all there's a whole class. Easily. And you're just teaching that Something in the way that I set up the grade book. Okay. It gets in or it doesn't get in or I exclude it and I have to include it and I'm still learning the, the okay. way of the nuances and, and, and tricks. You know what I mean? You've done everything you're supposed to do. Good. What's that, Brad? Would you happen to know any employment opportunities for the summer? Yeah. Perfect. Because I do have one. All right. Absolutely do. Cool. Um, so I am going to be doing um, some research on soil health. Basically, just going to be growing grass and cutting it. And I mean, it's, it ain't hard. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Quit my current job. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, let me get my. I need to look at my budget and see what that is, so that way I can tell you what it is. Um, and if we need to find any other supplement income for like I don't know if it's 20 hours a week or 30 hours a week and if you need 40 then we can find another way to get it, it, it doesn't have to be a lot just a little bit because I can do like I'm just wanting something to do to do sure sure that worked perfect because I was just like I need to send out an email and try and recruit a student worker so that will work I will get an email sent to you today um, and figure out how we need to go about getting that started or when that starts and whatever that looks like. So, perfect, thank you so much. That thank helps me out a million. Helps me out, see you. Cool, that's what, that's what this is all about. What's up, Andrew? You good? I'm just getting everything together. Yeah. I'm trying to get my life back together. Hey, it happens, dude. I'm trying to get mine the same way, man. You good? Yes, sir. All right, man, you ever, you ever need a year to hear, brother? I got you. Also, I got two of them actually. So I appreciate it. Don't ever hesitate to, to stop by and say, hey. Cool. 